Jane Fernand. I am a research fellow at the Innovation Value Institute in Maynooth. I am also an associate lecturer in innovation management at Maynooth University. Uh, prior to joining Maynooth, I was a Fulbright Scholar in the US. Um, and while I was there, I was doing research on um, how different multidisciplinary teams uh, within a healthcare context shared knowledge to develop um, uh, shared clinical pathways or um, uh, cl clinical practice guidelines. These teams that were developing these clinical pathways were by and large multidisciplinary, so we were looking at um, kind of pediatricians coming together with intensive medicine uh, or emergency medicine working with labour and delivery and, and midwifery. So we had very, very different disciplines coming together, but we also had very different professionals coming together as well. So we had doctors and nurses and other allied health professionals that were working together. Um, and so there was an awful lot of different types of people and different types of knowledge coming to bear um, and trying to generate some sort of consensus, I suppose, to, to to steal uh, Jose's words, but trying to bring that knowledge together and get a starting point where all these people could talk to each other from, um, from, from the same page to begin with was, was a, huge, uh, a huge part of being able to develop these care process models. So we're all very knowledgeable and skilled individuals in our own right, um, and our knowledge and our skills are by and large the product, the cumulative product of many, many years of formal and informal education and experience and figuring it out as we go along and so on. And what happens as we develop our knowledge and our skills is that we, we deepen our expertise and we find ourselves creating, uh, creating these kind of knowledge wells. Um, we become highly, highly focused and highly specialized within our own areas of expertise and again, Jose stole my line about we know more and more about less and less until we know everything about nothing. What we want to do is start to break out of these disciplinary silos. But it's very difficult to do that because we've invested a huge amount of time and a huge amount of ourselves into developing this expertise and it becomes very tied up with our own identity and who we, who we see we are and our place in the world. Um, it also means that we're, we tend to be kind of surrounded by peers who have analogous experiences and an analogous world view. So there's kind of a, a confirmation bias going on that the way we're looking at a particular problem, the, the approach that we take to trying to identify a problem in the first place, or what represents a problem to us, tends to be very much constrained by the expertise that we have. And so what we want to do is start to broaden that out begin to elaborate our knowledge and expand our understanding, broadening our world view. And we can do this by sharing and explaining to people that come from another disciplinary background. But that can be very, very difficult because their expertise is such that we might be using the same words but talking about different things. Or the other side of it, we might be talking about the same things but using different words. So trying to build that understanding in the first place can be quite difficult. But what happens when we manage to st when we start managing to do this is that we actually become more reflexive about our own knowledge and our own understanding. We're better able to um, better able to communicate what we know, how we know it, why we know it, why we do things in a certain way, and it helps us to improve our own understanding of our own knowledge and our own skills. It helps us to frame what we know uh, in a, w within a different context, and it helps us then to make things that are relevant and significant within our worldview relevant and significant within another worldview as well. And that's where the real key for starting to come up with new ideas and this cross-pollination uh, cross of ideas comes from. It's also a reciprocal process. So as we're developing our own worldview or kind of expanding our worldview, the people that we're talking with, their worldview is expanding as well to accommodate the knowledge that we're sharing with them. It expands our horizons. It allows us to um, start to spot new opportunities. We begin to develop some fluency in terms of talking to each other in each other's languages. We start to appreciate the concerns 
that are relevant to um, another group. So say, for instance, environmentalists working with engineers, their, their concerns and the main things of interest to them are going to be somewhat different. But as you start to uh, understand what is relevant and what is of significance to the people that you're talking to, you begin to expand your own understanding of where you're going and, and, and develop develop ideas around how to respond to those uh, and, and we start learning from unexpected sources and from an innovation perspective we really start to spot opportunities to create something new. Now it's not trivial to do this. There's a certain amount of safety and I'm sorry, we'll go back there a second. There's a certain amount of safety and certainty when we're within our own paradigms, within our own uh, within our own disciplines. We know what to expect. Um, and when we say something, we can, we can kind of anticipate what sorts of reactions we're going to get. We can't really anticipate in the same way when we're dealing with people from different disciplines. And as I said before, we become very invested within our own knowledge as well. We spend a lot of time developing this expertise um, through education and through experience and so on. But it can be very exciting to push the boundaries of what is considered normal within any particular discipline um, and push the boundaries of what's taken for granted. Using multidisciplinary teams as a way of generating innovation within organizations is not something that's particularly new. But it tends to be something that the kind of the acclimatization of getting these people together to start working together is something that's kind of it's a taken for granted. It's a you guys all work together and figure out between yourselves how you're going to work together and, and, and start to get on with each other. So these, the idea of a multidisciplinary team is often considered to be a means to the end of producing whatever, whatever the goal is. Um, but there's very little kind of explicit recognition of the value of the end of developing a team that can work together and developing those skills to be able to communicate across uh, different, uh, di different boundaries. Whilst I was working in the US, uh, some of the issues that I, that I found with these um, multidisciplinary uh, and, and kind of cross-functional teams was that there were differences uh, within, within the organizational culture, but there was also micro-cultures in operation with, with, these, with these groups. So there was, there was kind of basic ex expectations and uh, basic expectations were kind of different for these different people. So, they found it difficult to be in the first place to start communicating with each other. There were also very different, uh, very differences between management styles for different groups of people, um, and even leadership styles, and who who would assume the role of leader within these different groups. Um, I also mentioned the the uh, kind of the professional identity that we build up and invest uh, our own um, integrity within our, our uh, professional identity. And this also carries through in, in kind of disciplinary identities as well. So what a, what a to, to use the, I suppose, the very simplistic uh, division between doctors and nurses um, and how, uh, how, how, they would, um, how, how they would comport themselves would be quite different to each other. But similarly, uh, an ER nurse would behave in very, very different ways to a midwife or a, or a labour and delivery nurse. So their, their expectations of how the world works and their understanding of how the world works is very different. How they went about identifying problems, what constituted a problem to these people was very, very different as well. Um, and then the approaches that they would take to try to solve those problems was also different. And then, of course, there was the individual's personalities. So what we found was that across different teams that were trying to work towards developing these unified care process models, there was a vast difference between uh, how one team worked versus how another worked. There were a number of key corollaries between the different teams, though, things that we could trace, things that were traceable. Um, and it, it kind of stood whether, whether you were a, a part of a successful team or not. The successful teams were more open. So they were willing to consider things outside of their own disciplinary constructs. They were flexible. They, they, they were willing to rewrite the rules if necessary, or to throw out the rule book if, if that suited them. They were, 
they were willing to allow themselves to be vulnerable as well. They were much more comfortable with the idea of not knowing what was going to happen. They were willing to take the chance with the uncertainty and to allow themselves to be comfortable with that uncertainty. I'll come back to the practice makes perfect in a moment. The unsuccessful teams, or the teams that were less, uh, less coherent or less cohesive, they tended to be very much, this is how we do it. This is our paradigm, and this is, uh, this, this is our domain, and we are the experts, and this is how you do it. And you, you know, don't you come in here with your, with your, different, uh, with your different approaches um, and suggest we should do things differently, because we're the experts. They were also very much by the book. And this ties back to the idea of the, uh, the flexibility and the vulnerability. They wanted rules. They wanted to know what to do if then else. They, they wanted to write the rules if there weren't rules that already existing. They wanted to write those rules and then they would make people stick to those rules that they had just written. Command and control was very much a feature of kind of the management styles. This was something, again, that kind of feeds back to the fear of uncertainty. That if you just follow these rules, if you, we, we are going to legislate for every eventuality and we're going to have these, these rules specified to the nth degree of granularity and this is how we are going to cope with the uncertainty that we're facing. There was also then a, a kind of a lack of leadership uh, in evidence. So while the management uh, styles might have been quite strong in terms of the, the command and control, the leadership element was very much missing. And there was very little buy-in from the people who were working on the ground uh, in in, and very little empowerment for them to feel like they were contributing to what was going on. Coming back to the point about practice makes perfect, the, uh, the successful teams were ones that were, uh, they had tried things out before and things hadn't worked or things had worked but they had learned from that experience and they had moved on and they had continued and they had built up a kind of a, almost a buffer um, a, that, they were, that they were willing to try things out. They were willing to make themselves vulnerable and they were willing to see if something worked. They were happy to try the uncertainty and try and create some uncertainty in that space. And if that wasn't possible, then they'd come back to the drawing board. So who's for tea? This, is, this kind of comes back to the question now about how do we, as educators, how do we try and generate these skills or try and uh, uh, help people develop these skills? particularly within a traditional education model where everybody's hived off into their different disciplines from the word go and you're trained to think in a certain way and you're trained to approach problems in a certain way. Um, and we tend to be, uh, as I said, surrounded by people with an analogous worldview. So how do we help people to develop these skills that kind of bring them into contact with people from outside of their own disciplines? I'm quite lucky in that uh, the innovation management module that I teach has 300 final year students a little bit late to be getting my hands on them. But these students come from across the university faculties. I have engineering students, business and management, entrepreneurship, product design, arts, music technology. I have a few theologians in there as well because it's Maynooth and you know you get theologians everywhere in Maynooth. But what happens is I have this melting pot of really diverse people with really diverse educational backgrounds and really diverse disciplinary training and I mix them up and they hate me for it. They really do. Some people are really, really uncomfortable with being lumped into a group in their final year and being told to go forth and innovate and create something. But what I have done with these teams is to try and generate a safe space where it's okay to try something new, where you're rewarded for trying something new, not necessarily for the success of the outcome, but that if you try something a little bit different, um, and even if it's an abject failure, then that's okay because you tried something, you figured out how to talk to somebody that was not from your own background um, and that you were able to expand your own understanding a little bit. So, I would just like to leave it there. If anybody has any questions, comments, uh, you can email me or tweet me. And that is that. Thank you very much. Thank you.